the Friends of Lake Warner Virtual Watershed Symposium. Uh, this is a new and innovative experience for all of us. We haven't done this before, um, but we're really excited about it. We know a lot of the presenters well, and we've been networking and working on this issue for a long time. Our keynote speaker is Sherry Ruane, and from Weston and Sampson. Um, and Sherry, if you'd like to introduce yourself with any other credentials, please do so. Welcome. Sure. Thank you. I am psyched to be here. I went to school with Melissa um, right after they invented the printing press. <laughs> Melissa and I were together studying landscape architecture. And um, so after, um, I'm not going to go through my entire resume, I promise. But after that, I did work for the city of Boston in a public uh, servant capacity and then went back to get my master's degree and then have been in private practice since then and always been working in an interdisciplinary company. And so that's sort of what I am bringing to you guys today is a, a few thoughts about um, how important that is as it relates to what you're focused on, the watershed, the late, you know, all that stuff. Um, so I'm a vice president at Weston and Sampson and um, I actually was the president of BSLA, so I don't want anyone to think that I'm misrepresenting myself, but, but um, was past, was president, then past president, then president again, because uh, we need, I needed to step back in, and now I'm trustee of the Boston Society of Landscape Architects, and so I interact at a national level with a lot of folks who are dealing with issues exactly like this, um, and helping to try to strategize, you know, um, power in numbers. So the landscape architecture planning community often will advocate for, for endangered landscapes and other things. And I feel like that offers a little bit of perspective as well. So um, you want me to just jump right in? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So, um, so I was thinking about this topic that you all are focused on. And I actually got some amazing history on the site um, this morning via text. <laughs> I really appreciated that. Um, I'd done a little digging, but there's a lot of history around the site. And it was so fascinating to me that um, 1670 is when the lake was initially created. So we're working right now on Boston Common, um, which was like 1634. And I feel like a lot of really important moves in the landscape were made in the 1600s that people have completely written off because it wasn't their time frame. And I think that that's, it's telling actually how um, sometimes how, you know, personally centric we can be. But as I, as I thought about sort of what the goal you guys are heading towards and what you're defining as success, I think one of the things that really struck me is how interdependent the thinking has to be. Right? It can't just be about science. It can't just be about natural resources. It can't just be about the immediate watershed. It literally has to be socially and economically, and there has to be a lot of consideration. And a lot of the work that we do, um, we like to tout interdependence as a method of operating. And it's different than multidisciplinary. And it's different than just saying it's collaborative, right? It actually means that everyone around the table is literally dependent on the other people around the table in order to get to the right solution. And that takes a different mindset. It can really get tripped up if there's big egos around the table. Not that any of us would fall victim to such a, you know, trite uh, human condition, but other people might really get caught up and think that they are the expert in, you know, cyanobacteria, and they are the expert in eutrophication, and they're the expert in these things. And so when you're sitting around the table, they're not listening to anything the landscape architect or the water quality, whatever, has to say because they're the expert. And what I've found is that that is very limiting <clears throat> in creating a breakthrough. And for me, what breakthrough means is, and if this is what it feels like you guys are committed to, <laughs> you are looking to create an outcome that is so awesome for the watershed and for the lake that you're willing to commit to it 
even before you know how to get there, right? It is such a discontinuous leap, right? You're, you're suffering with all sorts of different issues that are compromising the watershed, and that's what's brought you guys together, right? Is to figure out how to make it healthier in general and make it a, an asset and a resource. And if you were to just put one foot in front of the other and say, okay, it's polluted or it's this, or there's invasive species or whatever, you might be so overwhelmed, right? And you would just take little tiny pieces. But instead, what, I'm, what I feel like, what I'm perceiving you guys are trying to do is you're trying to create this future, this alternative future that is awesome and so inspiring that you're all here to talk about it. You know, we all get only so much time, energy, and money right? Those are really our resources. Uh, I'll throw health in there too. Um, less in our control, but time, energy, and money, we certainly have control over. And what you're choosing to spend that time, energy, money, and energy on, um, at least in this part of your life, is really the improvement of this watershed and the advocacy of this watershed. And so as a result, I think what's inspiring to me is to see that a lot of this is really community driven, frankly. It's like you could choose to spend your time, money, money, and energy on a lot of things, right? But what you're choosing to do is actually improve the environment and actually be pretty civic-minded about it. So you are consciously choosing to, to do that in a way that, frankly, is giving back well beyond yourself. So one of the things that I've come to realize um, in journeys such as this one, and I've taken on in my own life a bunch of different breakthrough opportunities. Some have been more successful than others. <laughs> Some have been complete failures, but you learn from the failures as well. And I'll say that one thing that really helped me, and I offer this to you just for your consideration, is the difference between um, discipline and commitment. So discipline, in my experience, is a really rigorous, I'm sort of imagining like a drill sergeant in your head, like you got to do this, you got to show up, you got to, um, you know, get the data. You got it, and you have. If you haven't done it, then there's a lot of like, really abusive <laughs> self self talk or communal abusive. Stuff. Like we didn't get that done, and that's a failure. And commitment is actually a far more nurturing, like your best friend, right? Commitment is like that. It's amazing that you guys are committed to creating this future. And if things don't go perfectly well, commitment sort of like lifts you back up like a friend would. Like if I called Melissa and was like, I tried to do this thing and it was such a failure, she'd be like, oh, Sherry, try this or keep moving or you've already made progress, right? Where discipline would sort of like smack you around a little and tell you how, how you failed. Commitment, I feel like, is much more about carrying on, even if the path between where you are and where you want to get is unknown or frankly circuitous, like you have to be ready to, to commit. And it feels to me like this group in particular has really got clarity around the commitment and the outcome that you guys are looking to create. And I love to find, to come across groups like this. And to me, it's no surprise that Melissa is deeply embedded because she's always been the type of person that can find a cause that frankly is, is inspiring and important, but then infuse it with energy that um, sometimes I wonder where it comes from. But um, I feel like here, there's so much commitment and potential to get to the breakthrough outcome, frankly, that I'm super excited to hear more and learn more about where you guys are headed and also offer sort of Weston and Sampson has a lot of different engineers and scientists um, available. And if there is anything that we can do, that I can do, to provide some additional resources um, to be helpful, that is something that absolutely I'd be interested in doing. But I feel like um, the history of the place you guys are working on, right, the 1670s is really first recorded history, odds are, humans came in contact with it long, long, long before then. And its evolution in time and its importance to society, I think it can, you know, I feel like development happens, human development happens, and it doesn't really take into consideration the possibility there. 
and then it's compromised. But now what you're getting back to is how it becomes a larger part of the fabric around Hadley. And I do want to say that um, I did spend time in Hadley, mostly driving through it, because I went to UMass and I rode in Northampton at the <laughs> boathouse on the Connecticut River. And so I would drive through Hadley either at 4.30 in the morning or at 7.30 in the morning, late in both directions, but was told by my dad that Hadley was the asparagus capital of the world. And after a little bit of research, what I learned was that it would potentially was um, self-proclaimed, but I'm going to take it anyway and say that um, I feel like locations like this, right, that have so much passion around them, self-proclaimed, that's amazing, as far as capital of the world, doesn't even matter if it's true or not. It has become true in many people's minds. I feel like similarly, the inspiration and the, the commitment to creating a healthy, vibrant watershed that becomes a resource um, to society and in, in bigger ways that make inclusive and really um, multi-generational um, improvement is pretty awesome. So I applaud you all uh, and really I'm looking forward to learning more about the cause and um, yeah, would just, I'm excited to um, find out more about how our interests overlap. And I'll end at 1213. That's so great, Sherry. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I wish we had known you four years ago when we were needing the dam repaired and you could have done that pro bono. That would have been super. That would have been amazing. <laughs> I mean, Our geotechnical engineers would have been really excited for yeah, me to call them and tell them about that pro bono we project. Used, we could have used the $650,000 for something else. Um, <laughs> Yes, so so well said and so inspirational. It's very true that this um, this project was rooted around that dam repair, but the vision went deeper than that, and it was because of the layers of uh, people that were involved, and I would say the landscape in itself is extraordinary, and. Uh, it's been a great privilege to work with the people of Hadley and it's been a great project for a watershed and wetland person. So yeah, it has taken, I think I started in 2008. So I think we're at like 13 years of really sort of plugging at it. So this is why it's good to share, you know, what, what it takes, I think. Um, okay. Uh, do we have any other questions from audience members? We've got a little bit of time before Brian comes on. Are there other dam projects that you've worked on, Sherry? Yeah, we actually, um, we worked on a, a dam project at the Arlington Reservoir in Arlington, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, the Office of Dam Safety wanted like the, you know, the atomic version of go in, rip everything out, come in with fresh, clean dam. And the community was like, no, no, we'd like to keep the trees. We'd like to keep, you know, the, the sort of environmental quality that this landscape has right now. And so our geotechnical engineers actually developed a strategy where instead of removing vegetation and, and sort of disturbing what had become an important part of that landscape, they actually drove sheet piles into the existing berm to preserve the vegetation and preserve the landscape quality and the habitat and all those things, but still meet the needs of the Office of Dam Safety Permitting. So it needed to be the impenetrable barrier, you know, it needed to be all the things, but they were able to come up with a strategy that worked with the landscape and also met the safety requirements. And so that's something we've actually carried through many communities because we find again and again often people perceive sort of environmental quality and spatial quality with engineering safety at odds and they don't need to be mutually exclusive they actually can come together to create um you know preserve and and protect yeah so you look for, you look for mutually overlapping goals you know on common ground wherever you can find it right and i mean that's in, right and I, so I think that that's going to be particularly interesting to some people who are going to be involved uh, or who are going to be participating in this 
you know, who those players are, you know, I mean, you find out about them pretty quickly when you're dealing with the dam because office of dam safety is sending you nasty letters every, That's uh, right. but, uh, you know, little, little, do you know, the historical commission has a big effect on any historical landscape and the conservation commission is going to have wetland oversight and DEP is going to care about any other core habitat or type of landscape. And so all of those agencies and, and then as well as the local knowledge, you know, the people who have lived there and who drive there every day and who your eyes are on the ground, people who fish, people who boat and the things they see and they bring to it too. So Brian had a raised hand. Was that, was that unintentional? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Hi folks, thanks so much um, for the keynote, Sherry. Um, I had a, sort of question about one thing you mentioned was, you know, sort of the dynamic of knowing where you want to go and maybe not knowing how you want to get there. One thing I'm not super, super clear on is sort of, I should have read the Friends of Lake Warner website before I jumped in. One thing I'd be curious about is sort of what the end goals are. No, I shouldn't say end goals, but sort of mission and where the group's going. And then specifically a question in there is, um, I know the lake itself is a really important of the watershed group's mission um, and wondering how the group is dealing with the dynamic of dam removal being such a big part of the watershed restoration world, whereas it seems like that's probably not a goal for the, the, for the friends group. An interesting point. Well, as a, um, as a person who was trained in fish biology and coming out of the Northwest of California, the last thing that I ever thought I was going to be taking on was a dam repair project. Mm -hmm. So uh, I came at this, uh, Terry Blunt, who was a infamous uh, conservationist and a big party career worker for DCR and helped preserve a lot of the range, sat on Valley Land Fund's board um, mm -hmm. when the dam was acquired and got me involved in 2008. And um, I think, so the, the question we, we asked ourselves a lot of what the values of having a dam or not, you know, was uh, definitely free flowing aquatic connections were important. It also was a historic landscape as a lake and had a lot of use by the community as a lake. So when you went back then we had several public meetings to sort of address what interest, what do people want there? You know, what we didn't own it initially either. Kestrel owned it when they took over Valley Land Fund. So, you know, and, and Division of Ecological Restoration was right there saying, oh, we'd be happy to remove this. You know, even not even knowing maybe about the, the TMDL and the phosphorus load coming from lake sediments and from that watershed. So we have one of the highest phosphorus loads in the Connecticut River Valley um, for our tributary. And so there, there is a, can, you know, if you did release, if you did open up the dam and didn't deal with those sediments, then you could potentially have a reintroduction of sediments in the Connecticut, which would affect the Long Island Sound TMDL and everything downstream. So there were those considerations. And there was also the considerations of established wetlands over hundreds of years, you know, on our perimeter of the lake that had uh, come into some sort of balance, right? Ecological balance, it's a very rich, wetland ecosystem and not like they're not willing to let you take down a dam but the impacts to the littoral zone and the rest of the watershed I think had to be evaluated and when we started to look at that that got fairly complex you know if you wanted to talk about doing a uh, an EIR or something <laughs> to remove a dam you're talking about doubling or tripling the amount of money that it took to repair it and even to remove it cost more than it took to repair it. So that also, I would say, you know, economic considerations were a factor. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, you know, if the community, if the community had said, well, the dam's been there, nobody wants to fix it. The lake doesn't have any value as a lake recreationally, let's go ahead and remove it. Then that would have happened, but they didn't. And so now I think, you know, again, as a watershed and wetland restoration type person, I've looked to connect with the people who address these issues, you know, either with um, sort of putting together things like fish ladders or, you know, trying to reconnect areas that are disconnected 
there was so much work to be done in this watershed with E. coli bacteria pollution, with nutrient pollution and type of best management practices and stormwater innovations and community education. There were all of these other things that could have been done that are part of the watershed restoration process. So we tried to evaluate those and put those all, you know, on the table and think about them all as we're making decisions and try and make decisions based on data too. As we started collecting more data, how is the lake doing year to year? You know, were things getting any better from the watershed? Is it all in the sediments? And trying to make those type of evaluations and, and, and make our decisions based in a scientific way. So that's been part of the analysis too. And I don't think that that question has ever sort of ended, Brian, as they're sort of, you know, they're living relics, these hunks of concrete that are in the watershed. And so um, 50 years from now, maybe that community and, that, and, and those people will decide that it's time for it to go. And maybe it will. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Um, I'm going to second everything Jason said. I had my doubts also because of the usual, um, you know, current thinking about dams. I'm going to add one more thing. The Lake Warner has also served as a source of irrigation for farmers whose plots, you know, abut the lake. And if we were down to a small stream in the last I don't know, 10 years, we've had some extreme drought and I have seen the people in my neighborhood, I live over on Roosevelt Street, the farmers um, pumping from Lake, from Lake Warner or from the river sections that are um, wider and fuller because of the dam. And um, I think historically in the past, it was also a source of water for fire suppression. Um, though that's not needed the same way now. Um, before we had a hydrant system, but I, you know, I saw the farmers in my neighborhood really suffer through a few droughts and um, it is a real resource to them. Thanks for that reminder, Michelle. Yeah, really important irrigation and riparian rights, definitely an issue in our watershed. And statewide, I think, you know, that whole question of, you know, when do you need a permit? You know, only after 100,000 gallons a day, which is one cubic foot per second a day. So for a small stream, seven and a half, 15 cubic feet per second, running at a base flow during the summer, that's not many users, you know, to, to really dry up a stream. And so those are also questions that we sort of have, have expanded from this, discuss, from this project and this discussion. Any other questions?